Overwhelmed by nutrition, medicine, and the universe in general? Check out the YouTube channel Professor Dave Explains for the background knowledge you need. This is not edutainment. These are comprehensive series that summarize college-level courses, from chemistry and biology to physics, astronomy, math, and more. It's general knowledge served in Cliff Notes fashion, and it's fun to watch. Go to ProfessorDaveExplains.com or YouTube search Professor Dave Explains. The podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that satisfy your curious mind. I'm John Rojas, filling in this week for Chris as he's on business travel. This week we have quite the episode. I'm going to cut to the chase, let you know who our guest is. Chris speaks with Cheryl Heller. Cheryl is a business strategist and designer, and she's had quite the storied career. She's the founding chair of the first MFA program in design for social innovation at the School of Visual Arts. And she also has an amazing book that came out in October, The Intergalactic Design Guide, Harnessing the Creative Potential of Social Design. We're going to jump right in as Chris talks with Cheryl about her book and social design. Enjoy. talk about social design. Your, your brand new book is about social design. And from just that phrase, I seemingly know nothing about it. I know this is a very basic place to start, but for many, I think this is a, a new phrase in their vocabulary and perhaps a new idea. Could you tell us the basics of what social design is? Sure. If you think about traditional design, whether it's fashion or automobiles or buildings, Design is a process for creating something that didn't exist before. And designers have this innate skill of coming up with new ideas and and being able to implement them in a way that is that meets certain criteria. That design process in social design is applied to human relationships, to any kind of social context, to any issue where humans are involved. It applies at a scale that's bigger than developing a product or service. So it applies at the level of the wicked problems that we talk about, climate change and poverty, broken food systems. And it's done collaboratively with larger groups of people instead of having this expert who goes away to some studio in the middle of the woods in Connecticut (laughs) and comes up with a solution, you know, and then dictates that's the way to go. What I found in doing research for this, what I found so unique and also disorienting almost is I I know very little about design in general. So trying to first wrap your mind around how do we define that and then how do we apply it to social situations is just a seemingly nuanced or, or niche idea that has vast implications. Is this a field that you've always been aware of, interested in? I mean, I know about your years and years of success in various types of design, but I'm curious, really, it seems like you've turned your superpowers to save the world, if you will. Was this a, uh, you know, something that had been on your mind for a while? Yes, in that I've been doing it for a number of years, but I I started out thinking I was going to be a painter and I was going to teach <clears throat> fine arts in college, and then I somehow missed the fact that I needed to support myself, and <laughs> accidentally accidentally got a job uh, as a designer. So I've been doing that for a very long time, and as I did accomplish more of what one is told that it's good to accomplish in that field, I started feeling the, the emptiness of it. And, and I used to say, you know, as a result of all of these years of, of, you know, what became 
and exciting careers, I knew how to make people want things. And that's part of what design is, right? How do we create something that represents people's dreams that whether it's the device they want to hold, you know, um, a new, a new technology, uh, a new piece of technology, or it's uh, any other kind of product or service that they want to have or be a part of. So that became empty. And what I started looking for was, yeah, so what, what are you going to do with this? Right. I mean, how that's, that's contributing to the parts of the world that, that were the parts of our human civilization that aren't particularly good for us or meaningful or beneficial for the environment. So as a person who has the ability to do this, you know, there's a wonderful quote by Bucky Fuller, and we can go back and talk about who he is, uh, but he was, he was at a very low point in his life. Uh, he'd failed as an architect. He couldn't support his family. And he said to himself, if the future of the world depended on who I am and what I do, who should I be and what should I do? And, um, you know, we all have the capacity to create things. Uh, we don't all know that we have that capacity and we don't all have the agency of having this process, but that's what social design is. Let's talk about what you just said. Uh, we all have the capacity to create things, but we don't always have the agency to do so. Tell me more about that. Right. Can I back up and talk a little bit about how social design works? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. then I think the agency will be clear. And, and I'll start by saying, you know, every everything alive has the capacity to create. We create all the time. We create things all day long, whether it's cooking a dish or, you know, building something in the garage. So so that's a human, a human capacity. Mm. Um, but social design is different from traditional practices and 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 even from from the way that corporations work and the and what we learned in the industrial um from the industrial revolution that social design invites people to participate in the creation of their own solution or of their own future so typically in an organization you have silos of expertise. You have the marketing department and the research department and the engineering department and the sales department. And, and a new product will be developed sequentially. It'll go from marketing research to whatever and down the line. And, and people won't have the big picture. And so what you get are individual parts. Uh, in social design, you bring people from all those different disciplines together and you include the customer in whether that's a poor person that you're developing a service for or you know a customer for uh, a, a corporation's product and people see the whole system and everyone participates in doing the research and coming up with ideas and experimenting so number one when you pull people from different parts of a company that are not used to working together, you change the relationships of those people and you therefore change the relationships within the organization. And when you teach people the skills of doing research and understanding things from a, a customer or an end user's point of view of, come, of, of how to come up with multiple ideas, of how to reframe a problem, how to prototype, how to implement, people have those skills. And what they realize is, those skills are not inaccessible and they realize that they have agency to change things that they didn't know they could. And I don't know whether that whole thing made sense. Feel free to dig in and <laughs> no, it okay. does. And we, that is where we are going to go digging in. So the, the agency portion definitely makes sense. And I've never thought about our innate ability to create. And I think what you're saying is that we can take this, you know, long understood and, and potentially mastered idea of design. And then we can apply it in all social settings, which is where we technically live 24 seven. Social design is a, is a system that's made up of some principles and a process and then particular kinds of skills. And the principles are values that, that sort of maintain the integrity of it. So one of the principles is that Somebody sitting in a high rise doesn't know all the answers, can't understand what 
and that ideas come from inside the community instead of from the side. Another principle is that learning is more important than knowing. And so you bring this sense of inquiry, right? So you're assigned to make something, right? Most of the time, people aren't in a position to question why. And so you bring that sense of, of not knowing what the answer is in advance. Um, and then the process is, it's pretty standard, right? You, you do research, you, you scope an issue to see, you map where it touches other people, other issues, right? What the, what the context of it is. You develop multiple ideas, you evaluate those ideas, you try them out. That it's another principle is that it's based on experimentation instead of long range plans. Things things are so chaotic these days. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you're talking about the disruption of industry or the disruption of the ecosystem. But we can't know five years in advance. So this whole notion in business of of I want a detailed plan for how much we're going to make and where this is going to go and what it's going to accomplish are are not as effective as they used to be. So in social design, you learn to take a step and watch what happens and an experiment and then base the next step on that, all with a very specific vision in mind so that you have a North Star and you're constantly pivoting uh, in, in an, uh, the, the um, a goal of getting there. I want to go back to one thing, and a lot of the reason this podcast was started is to find meaning, myself and, and John, my, my co-founder. And I watched a video of you, and then you mentioned it at the beginning of this interview as well, where you talked about, you know, you, you did the things in design that you're supposed to do. And, and by the way, and we'll talk about this in the intro, but you really reached some incredible heights in just the design world and, and running firms and things like that. Uh, but you said you know, it felt hollow to some extent. And I have long felt similarly in a lot of situations. It's why I founded a nonprofit. It's why this show started. It's why now I go teach and train people all across the country on things like effectiveness. Do you wonder why you felt that way? You'd reach these, this pinnacle or you'd reach the top of a lot of these organizations and still felt that hole. Do you wonder why you felt that way, but others seemingly don't? I think Lots of people feel that way or have the awareness of, of wanting to have a higher purpose and, and maybe can't articulate it. I had a couple of um, people enter my life who basically showed me how, and I think that's the big difference. One of them is a woman named Jamie Cloud who years ago, uh, my husband met her husband and invited them both for dinner and we got drunk and I said, what do you do? And she said, well, I teach, uh, sustain, I develop curriculum for sustainability education. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. What is that? And, uh, and, and, and I said, what do you call it? And she said, very proudly. Well, we call it the Sustainability Education Center, or SEC. I said, you know, there's another SEC, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to help you, but you have to tell me more about what you do. And she came down the next day with a stack of books. And I looked at her and I said, this is going to change my life, isn't it? And she said, yep, it usually does. And, you know, the books were David Orr and Paul Hawken and Donella Meadows and all of the people who were writing about the environment and our human impact on it. And it, and that set, set me reeling, trying to figure out, because I've always been concerned about the environment, and I've always been heartbroken about the way we treat it and treat other species. And this was a challenge to figure out, okay, smarty pants, you know, how do you apply what you know and what you do to something that you really deeply care about? I kind of vibe with that so well, and it, bring, it reminds me, as you're talking about treating other species... I saw a video of you online where you discussed some interactions with a a bird, a very intelligent bird. Would <laughs> yes. you would you mind sharing a little bit? Because here's the thing: there are very few times in a year where your I I, I feel your paradigm can shift or your thought process can really change. And that story to me, it it really shifted the way I think about intelligence. Well, there is a bird of a friend of mine is an artist and has devoted her life to understanding communication 
with other species. And sh- and she lives and works with an African gray parrot who probably has a um, vocabulary of, of over 3,000 words now. And what's interesting is that she taught him not as you would teach an animal to repeat things or memorize things, but as you would a child, that you have a conversation. And uh, this bird has conversations. Um, he, he had a bird mitzvah, uh, when he turned 13 and, uh, and he was talking about it all the time. And, you know, he's very excited. Of course, when everybody was there, he shut up because he was so nervous, but you know, he said, I think somebody's going to bring a big check. <laughs> wow. I think somebody's going to write a big check. Yeah. Um, and somebody did write a check, but maybe it was big by bird standards. Right. Um, but he, you know, he is, conscious he is he is the most extraordinary creature and you leave his presence thinking what just happened is that i had a conversation not not but a, a sentient conversation the first time he saw me i had a silver necklace on he said oh i like your necklace uh followed by you got any chocolate uh but yeah. he he talks about things like uh i grew him sunflowers in my garden because i wanted him to understand where the seeds he was eating came from, he he tracked and talked about the fact that he knew the pictures I was bringing to him of them growing were then the thing I showed up with, this big round green thing, and had a conversation about how you crack them. You know, his his um, his roommate uh, showed him how to crack the seed, and he said, oh, it's like a nut. Think about that, making that connection. When I heard this, what struck me is how much how much of an emphasis we place on language as a is a sign of intelligence but really it's just our common way of communicating so if there's another and one animal out there which i was not aware of really that can speak english enough to have a conversation what does that mean about intelligence and the lack of intelligence we are assuming of most other living things it means that we are the stupidest species on the planet for <laughs> for missing for missing the wisdom around us and what we could learn. And that's everything from do you know Katie Payne's work? I don't. She discovered that so amazing woman who spent the first half of her life with a microphone in the ocean. She was the one who developed whale who understood whale songs mm-hmm. and researched that and, and sort of picked up on the fact that they change. She was sitting at a zoo and felt a vibration. She was outside of two elephant pens. And it reminded her of when she played the organ and she would hit a very low note and felt it more than, and didn't hear it. So she came back with a sound guy and recorded it, sped it up, and and has discovered since that elephants have language. Not just they make sounds that that you know other people understand, but they they have a vocabulary, and that's all around us. It's it's everything from from paying attention to ants and how extraordinary they are to elephants to to every creature around us, birds, you know, crows. Uh, it's just it's. It's it's everywhere, and we miss it because we're so self-centered yeah. and and so in need of being superior to all of these other amazing creatures. I'm oh, sorry, that's my that's my soapbox. No, no, but it's it's just an interesting note because I'm going to tie it back into kind of design because you were talking about it in terms of language, but I similarly learned something recently that blew my mind, which was essentially that trees in a forest talk to each other through the fungi. Yeah. And they will send like messages through the webs of the the forest floor via these fungi to say all types of things. It's really astounding how much we are still unaware of. And I I think it's important. I guess the reason I'm bringing it up is that's why, again, this podcast is here is to remind ourselves how much we don't know. You know, lack of certainty, I think sometimes is a really good thing um, because it leaves us open to new understanding and interpretation. I was going to say that the reason we don't know it is we don't pay attention. And that's the link back to social design. Right. There was, um, I, in partnership with Babson college, uh, I worked, um, with the grantees of the Arthur blank foundation in Montana. And part of the workshop was to watch this extraordinary wrangler demonstrate how he communicated with the horse, just what the horse understood, what he got from every movement of the horse. Just the, it was the most extraordinary 
lesson. People were blown away by how much there is to understand and how much gets communicated if you simply pay attention. And social design begins with that, right? You don't assume, you, you, you actually listen and you inquire of, of who is going to be affected by what you're doing, what is it you're trying to accomplish, and what is a reality like that is different from yours but relevant to what you're doing. Exactly. One of the things, though, that I think it also is is at the core of it, and you mentioned this earlier, is the complexity of the world we live in gets overwhelming. Mm -hmm. We get inundated with so many things so fast, we haven't been able to evolve to understand the amount of inputs we have. And it's easy to just shut it down and focus on the things that are in our immediate future. And it's almost a self-preservation because we don't have the energy and the ability to attend to all of that stimulus. So what I find interesting in my new understanding of social design is that you, especially in your book, you talk about providing a, a process almost to deal with so much complexity. How would you say that social design helps us put maybe sanity in an, uns in an insane world or structure to complexity? Again, it's so much of the the reason uh, that social design works is the process, right? It gives you a set of steps for understanding, for making abstract things visible. Uh, for th there's an extraordinary organization uh, that we work with called um, Community Solutions, and their program built for zero that is using social design to end chronic and veterans homelessness in communities across the country, and they're having extraordinary success. So that that's you know no one has been able to figure it out because homelessness, of course, is connected to poverty, connected to mental health, connected to employment, right? And so. Typically, what you're what we're talking about with the complexity is everything is now interconnected, and you can't just find homes for people and put them in and expect to solve the problem. At any rate, social design is this process for understanding data, for understanding what to look at. For um, and in the case of Built for Zero, one of the big breakthroughs is the government does point in time measurement of how many people are homeless. So you get a list of saying, well, in your community of San Francisco, you know, there's a thousand homeless people. This process insists on a by name list so that you're not looking at a number taken once a year. You're looking at names of people and you have a, a, a data that describes whether they're chronically homeless, whether this is an event in their lives, whether they've been homeless before and gotten back on their feet. And that's the only way you can actually address it. So there are combinations for, for I mean, there are um, approaches to mapping big systems, but also for understanding things at a granular level so that you can act on them. What is a problem, very similar to what you just outlined, but let's try and take a different story so a problem or a case study you've seen, and how did they tackle that using social design? Sure. Uh, a great story is Jeffrey Brown of Brown Superstores in Philadelphia. He is a fourth generation grocer, and he has developed a, an empire of very high quality grocery stores, suburban quality grocery stores that succeed in food deserts in the poorest neighborhoods of Philadelphia. So step number one, Jeffrey Brown had a vision, not just to be a successful grocer, could he, cause he could have done that other ways, right? He could have picked rich neighborhoods. Uh, he wanted to use his grocery business to address issues of poverty and health. So the vision already is contains social value and it has purpose. Obviously, if he's going to succeed at addressing poverty, he has to be a successful store. So that implies all the other things that, that need to be true. He, instead of sort of bringing what he knew about the grocery business into the community, he, he begins and he continually has meetings with the community and he asks them what they want. So Instead of deciding what's sold in other neighborhoods or, you know, what the hot, hot products are, he talked to them about their religious beliefs, about their tastes, 
and he's constantly experimenting with the community. He will talk to the community about what he's going to try. He'll get their feedback. He experiments all the time with things like, if you're interested in helping people be more healthy, could you entice them to eat, you know, grilled chicken more than fried chicken? Or if you want to help people be more literate about what they eat, you know, would classes in, in, or tours of the store in how to read food labels work? At one point, the community, someone in the community said, hey, you know, uh, a lot of people who live in these neighborhoods can't, will never be able to shop in your store because they can't get jobs because they've been in prison. Why don't you do something about that? And so Jeffrey Brown started a, a nonprofit that trains people who have been in the, the criminal justice system and guarantees them jobs. And a third of his workforce now um, comes from this training school. So he doesn't go in with assumptions from somewhere else. He is constantly paying attention to what's happening and basing the next decision on that. He's constantly collaborating with his, uh, with the people that he's trying to, that he needs for support and that he wants to engage with. And these are sort of the key steps. And, and then there's the, you know, the creative part of it is the way he's solving these problems. You know, the, the programs he comes up with to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Well, and you know, you, you mentioned that, and I think this was in the book, there are people, well-known people in history who have done this kind of without thinking or without knowing the, the specifics or calling it social design. I know it, Oprah Winfrey stuck out to me. What is it about these people? Or if you have any kind of stories or abilities to highlight, how do they embody social design and uh, do it so fluidly? There are natural leaders who don't dictate, but they lead through collaboration. There are people who are naturally confident enough to experiment and to kind of um, sort of publicly admit that they don't have an answer yet uh, and try things. And I think we see them everywhere. We see people who um, who do lead through collaboration Um and who, uh, who, who are by definition creative instead of um, formulaic and dictatorial. Ah, I see. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Blinkist. In today's age, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and learn more, especially when the likes of social media can be so addictive and time-consuming. So you may think you don't have time to read a book or to develop yourself. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways and need-to-know information. So you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. 8 million people are using Blinkist right now, and it has a massive and growing library, from self-help, business, health, to history books. I like Blinkist because, well, let's face it, I don't have that much time, but in less than 15 minutes, I can fast-track my path to a more informed self. For example, I just went through the four-hour work week. That's a huge book. And Blinkist distilled it to the most important key takeaways. All right, so here's what you have to do. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com smart to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com smart to start your free seven-day trial. Again, that's Blinkist.com slash smart. And now back to the episode. What I want to talk about, which ties that plus the, the example you gave together, is in this world of social design that you are now in, you said earlier you knew how to make people want things through your experience previously. Having worked with the biggest companies on the planet, having taken small companies and made them large and all these things. What aspects of that, if you want to call it a previous life, the standard design, what aspects do you take from that, bring it into this social design world that add to your ability to deliver results? The most foundational things that you learned previously. The most foundational aspect of all of this is language. And it's, it's being able to articulate a vision that people want to 
support and that people want to see themselves doing and that people want to participate in. So I think of all the things I've learned, you know, I spent time as executive creative director at a international identity firm and we helped companies see themselves in a different way and see their potential in a different way. And that experience articulating a vision that sort of shows someone their higher self uh, and, and then using language to create the support necessary for them to accomplish that, right? You, you have a vision that includes higher purpose and, and, and then translate that to employees and translate that to customers and translate that to the media so that everyone understands it in the same way. That's probably, it's the thing I most love to do. And it's the most important thing I loved. I mean, from, I spent a couple of really unhappy years in advertising because I hated it, (laughs) but I learned more there than anywhere else in how you distill an idea that people get immediately and that they are attracted to. And when I started working with these social entrepreneurs like Eric Herzman in Africa who founded Ushahidi and iHub and has now founded Brick, I, I wanted to commit what I knew to helping people see and understand and want to be a part of something that was constructive and generative instead of destructive. Right. Oh, I love it. And what my favorite part of that is, because I said there's two parts to this question. The second part really was about articulating a vision. So I didn't know that's where you were going to go with it. But the reason is you mentioned it in in the example you gave in the case study about the, the guy with the grocery stores. His vision was to do it in food deserts. The nonprofit that I helped found a while ago is all about changing the food system. So that naturally caught my attention. But more so what it made me realize or or triggered really quickly is it's easier to say that after the fact right it's easier to say he had a vision to do this what's hard is coming up with that vision crafting it and i run into this i'm a, I'm a certified coach i did a lot of career coaching i run into this with people in all aspects of life what is your vision for x what is your vision for your career for your life, for your family, for your contribution, for your legacy, for your business, et cetera. So I want to hone in on this, especially since you said it's one of your favorite parts, because it's easier said than done. If if you could kind of talk to those of us in the in the world right now saying, look, you know, I'm I'm trying to articulate a vision in one of these places. How do we do that? Where do we start? Well, let me say it's much easier to do for someone else than it is for yourself. Ah. And, <laughs> and because it's hard to see yourself, right? Cause you can't be both immersed and also objective. You can't right. be outside observing and in the middle, but the answer to that is to get someone you trust and to talk it through with them. The most important thing. And, and I, and I think about it even, you know, I founded a graduate program and it was really hard to do. Uh, but you, you have to keep pushing at why something is important and why you're doing it, right? Why does it matter? The world doesn't need another company. The world doesn't need another nonprofit. The world doesn't need another group of people coming up with their own approach to solving anything, right? So really with, with mental discipline, demanding that you articulate the real reason why, and there's an exercise, um, called the five whys, right? Um, And if you keep pushing at that, you come to what's really important to you. I would also say Marshall Gantz, who teaches at the Kennedy School at Harvard, has some wonderful writing on narratives that uh, capture, uh, you know, cultural issues and cultural importance. He has an exercise about writing, story writing, that is great to do for yourself as you are thinking about developing a vision. Most of the time, and, and, and so that's get, get the real reason why it matters to you and will matter to the world down and don't, don't be easy on yourself there. The second thing that people do, uh, and this is universal is tend to speak in generalities, right? We use, we use pablum. We use nice words that we've heard before to talk about, you know, I want to contribute to people's well being. Well, that's sort of BS, right? Because how would you ever know you got there? It it has to be 
specific enough so that you will recognize it when you get there. And it has to be concrete enough so that it's very clear what you have to do to get there. So when Jeffrey Brown says, I want to have a grocery business that succeeds at helping people improve issues of poverty and homelessness, that's really specific. And and I, as I was saying before, you get absolutely the things that the conditions for success required for that. And you know, you know how big it has to be. You know, you probably know how profitable it has to be. You understand the need to sell products that people are going to buy, uh, and, and all the other things. And so you want a vision that is not so specific that you're going to outgrow it. It doesn't tell you how you're going to do it, but it is concrete enough to be clear in how you have to act to get there. First of all, the, the Marshall, Marshall Gantz is his name. Is that what you said? Yes. Yes. G A N Z. G A N Z. I cannot wait to look into that. Yeah. So, and we will, He's for those listening, awesome. we'll, we'll link to that because it's just on the top of my mind as is. There's two other things I wanted to kind of go deeper in, as you mentioned it. The first is this idea, you know, start with someone else. You said, you know, get somebody you trust. And I, I find that so counterintuitive for many. Uh, the reason is, you know, it's, Hey, what's your vision? Well, I got to talk to someone else. That seems so backwards. Wait, no, no, no. It's not someone else's vision. It's your vision. And I realize they're just helping you verbalize it. But I think oftentimes there might be a worry of contamination. And there was for me for a long time until I have a friend of mine who it's uncanny her ability to just help me take everything she knows about me and make it succinct. And I've never yeah. questioned why. I just keep going back to her. <laughs> For you to come out and say, look, one of the first places to help you come up with your vision is find somebody you trust. Why is that? What is it about other people's ability to see what we don't see that allows them to help us clarify things? Two things. One, I, I teach a class in communication design. And one of the, one thing I always say in the first class is it doesn't matter what you meant to say. <laughs> right. <laughs> it only, it only matters what somebody gets. Right. So intentions count for nothing. Right. You don't get a mulligan. You don't get to explain, you know, people, people see what you write or what you said. That's part of what this trusted person does. Right. The, the gap between what you think you're communicating and what's getting through only other people can help you. The second thing is the reason you trust this person and the, and the person you just described She's generous with you. She listens to you. She doesn't impose her own views, right? Listening is is a great act of generosity and kindness. Yeah. And when you do that, and when you actually pay attention to what someone else is saying and what you know of them and, and what you understand that they want to do, you 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 channel them, right? You're not telling them what to do. You're listening and telling them what makes sense and, and helping them articulate it in a way that has the same potency that they feel inside. First of all, that quote is one of the best things I've ever heard. It doesn't matter what you meant to say. It only matters what people get. And I'm sure <laughs> that that came from decades in the trenches of, you can call it advertising or design, but if you're trying to sell a product, I mean, that, that's got to be 101, right? That has to be something you know from the get-go. Absolutely. That comes from sitting in focus groups, watching people look at your work, saying, oh, my God, you idiot. How could you think that? And right. then you look at it and you think, well, because it says that. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I said. You know, people are they're incredibly literal. They won't cut you slack. You know, your mother will cut you slack right. when you're presenting to her. She's proud of you. But other people don't fill in the gaps. They don't they don't understand your intention. They only understand what you what you said or what you did. That, that's so fantastic. We actually, uh, some of the workshops that I teach for a company called Franklin Covey, we have a line that we use, which is people judge themselves on their intentions, but judge others on their actions. Exactly. And it's something that always stuck with me, but I like the way you worded it is more for me, at least about the messaging, right? So I, I'm mm -hmm. an ideas guy. I can have great ideas, but in, in my head, if they sound great, but when they come out, they don't, it doesn't matter at all. It's just great to me. The other thing you mentioned there, and, I, and this is bringing so much clarity, and I hope this is for listeners because I know everybody out there is striving for something. And so this is really about how to define what you're striving for in a business or whatever, is when you talk about why somebody else can help, 
as the owner of the idea, you have all these stories. Well, I failed in this in the past and I might not be good enough here and I've, I've not succeeded here. But the, the other person doesn't hear those stories. They just see what the rest of the world sees and says, look, this is it. Take all of the, the extraneous stuff away. This is what is left. I think it really helps get out of your own way a little bit. This is what it's le- is left. And, and also, what, what does this mean, right? I, when I do workshops or when I, when I work with anybody, you know, I get them to write what they do. And the number, uh, I- inevitably, there are very few people who will put something down that actually describes why they're unique and why it matters. They will, uh, so many of them, well, I'm a nonprofit that, you know, teaches this or that does that, right? No sense of, okay, but what are you going to accomplish in the world? And who cares that you're a nonprofit? That's a tech status, right? Right. (laughs) Um, You know, all of this stuff that just is habitual that people include in the description that you have to really, really brutally strip away. How do you know what to strip away? What matters and what will resonate with others to let your message or your business be heard and thrive? How do you know? You try it out. Um, you you experiment and you prototype. We talk a lot about prototypes in social design. And I always say the first prototype is when you say it out loud to your buddy. You know, <laughs> am I crazy? Uh, is there uh, anything here? Should I keep going? And you're constantly doing that. And if you look at any entrepreneur, they, you will see an evolution of how they talk about it. You'll see an evolution of what they understand. Um, Eric Kurzman, who I mentioned before, who's the founder of Brick, that whose vision is to be the first billion dollar African technology company generated there. And, and he wants to bring connectivity to the pioneer markets of the world. You know, he started out describing what he was going to do as the last mile connection to the internet. That made perfect sense to people at that stage as the product developed and as the the capabilities of the product grew, he outgrew that, but it didn't matter, right? You're constantly trying that out, but you're constantly aware of who you're reaching, who you're engaging. Is this making sense to, is this motivating the people I needed to motivate? I need to motivate. And you're always practicing, right? It's an ongoing thing. You don't get it right once and then it's done forever. Sure. Well, then my last question really is this. What do you think that the for-profit sector knows that the nonprofit doesn't? Meaning when you were working with these really large corporations who, who, who've been in business for quite some time, who have really have their business model set up, it's all about the numbers. It's about profit, you know, dollars and cents. They, I would imagine, attack these things differently then somebody who comes to you with a, a grand vision to change the world. What do they know about marketing, about design, about messaging that you find others truly don't understand or don't do a good job of? I think it's a really interesting question. And, and I love that you say people who come with a grand vision to change the world, because the difference lies in there. You can't act on a grand vision to change the world. You can only act on a very specific strategy and a very specific objective. And what for-profit companies know is how to succeed. They actually know how to sort out a problem. They understand that you have to be successful in order to accomplish anything. And what they're missing is a balanced, uh, a balanced vision, right? That, that puts whatever social value they're going to create at least at an equal level. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, as the financial value, the financial value has to be there. You can't succeed at creating social value unless you are successful. What they have is the ability, they know how to succeed. They know how to break things down. They know how to address them. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of nuance here, but, and, and the other thing is I find a lot of nonprofit organizations actually don't know how to collaborate. And the, the mission can get in the way. The mission can make people arrogant and it can make people, uh, believe that they don't need to, um, collaborate or they don't need to 
things or they don't need to have the same skills that for-profit companies have, right? So the um, Paul Pollock, who is another dear friend of mine and mentor, who ha- he is, uh, um, he's brought 20 million people out of poverty. He sold a million treadle pumps to farmers who make less than $2 a day. His view of eradicating poverty is market creation. So he is all about creating for-profit businesses that jumpstart economies where they don't exist. And I've written a couple of things that explain this, but, but one is an article about Paul that says, forget poverty about business. Uh, because the reason he's been able to do that is because he thinks like a businessman and he understands that there has to be value exchanged at every level that in order to be sustainable, uh, you need to make profit and everyone, everyone engaged in it needs to make profit. And that, uh, and, and he has a very tough minded view of purpose. You know, it can't be emotional. You don't get into these things because you want to contribute some amorphous thing to the world, right? You have to be hard nosed. You have to be tough minded about the way you approach doing it. Emotion is great for motivation, but that doesn't solve problems. The second thing I was going to tell you, I'm going to send you, I'll send you a link to that article. Also, and yes. I wrote an article called what we can learn from the folks we love to hate, uh, which is precisely what you said, right? <laughs> what did I advertising? Yeah. Advertising, it's sort of a neutral science, but it works, right? Right. Um, there's lots to learn from it. Well, yeah, I'm, please do send that article. We'll link to that as well, because I, I agree. I mean, we've had a chance on this podcast to talk to, for, for, there's a guy, his name's Steve McKee, and he runs a, um, a, a marketing branding firm actually up in the Northeast. And he's actually helped us for about a year as a podcast, just try to walk through some of the things you're talking about, craft a vision and and connect mm-hmm. with our listeners. Um, and it's funny because when I talk to him, it's very similar to some of the things you're saying, which is like, yeah, I mean, this idea of profit not being a, a, a bad word. And I'll, I'll never forget, you know, a, a quote I heard from a, pre, a, a past guest who said, you know, I can't give what I don't have. And there's all these things that they're very pertinent in the world of social good, because even as you said, nonprofits or or people with these grand visions can get arrogant. That resonated, right? Because you can say, look, I'm trying to save the world. I'm trying to save the animals. I'm trying to say, just listen to me. Just give me your money. Just whatever. Missing out on the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Missing out on the fact that, no, you have to be just as tactical in order to have the impact that you want. And I think that goes in any area for anyone listening. It it has to be the vision mixed with that tactical nature, which brings me back to, I do want to say, and we'll mention this in the intro as well, but your book is the intergalactic design guide, harnessing the creative potential of social design. And what it does, I think what your book does is take everything we've been talking about and it makes it systematic. It shows step-by-step shows, stories, case studies. So I just want to throw that out for those listening who are saying, look, I, I get it. I'm, I'm thinking my wheels are spinning very similarly to mine, uh, but I need to sit down and digest this more. I think that's a great resource. And I wanted to, to ask you, um, you know, if there's anything else that you wanted to guide our listeners to or any kind of last thoughts on that idea. Thanks. I, I think there's two things. One is the, the, principal takeaway from the book that I would love people to get is that this is not something that's someone else's job, that we all need to participate in creating change if we're going to be a viable species on this planet. Um, and the second thing is that to the notion of for-profit, non-profit, right, and, and being sustainable, I read something that was too painfully true, right? That that the people that are interested in creating social value, the people that are interested in addressing climate change, you know, we don't want to remain the people tinkering around at the edges. We want to be the default way of thinking. And if we're going to be the default way of thinking, we have to grow up. We have to become sustainable. We can't rely on charity. We have to find opportunities to become part of the economy and the general conversation. And, and I think we have the ability and the capacity, and this is the methodology to do that. 
I love it. And it just, I mean, not to belabor it, but it just made me think of, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I, admittedly, I don't know a ton about it, but I know the issues that they have set out to really fix or help. And when you think about it, right, that is the perfect example of somebody coming from, uh, you know, a for-profit, a capitalistic enterprise, uh, delivering some incredible technologies and then utilizing the wealth gained to focus on issues that they believe are the biggest that we face. And so on a large scale, that's what I think of when, when you talk about we can all do it and, and we have to focus on the, the, the tactics first as well. That's what popped into my mind. Well, Cheryl, I have to say I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned many new things, which is the point of setting out on this. Uh, again, the book is The Intergalactic Design Guide, Harnessing the Creative Potential of Social Design. And we will link to uh, the articles that you mentioned as well in our show notes. Um, and so again, just thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. You're a very good time. And um, I'm delighted that we had a chance to talk. Thank you. And yet another episode in the books. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Cheryl Heller. A reminder, her book, the Intergalactic Design Guide, Harnessing the Creative Potential of Social Design can be found at your local bookstore and on Amazon. And I know you've heard it a thousand times before, but if you decide to purchase her book, please do so through our Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. If you enjoy the show and you're sitting there, hey, how can I help out Smart People Podcast? Well, you can head over to iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review over there. Doing so helps us stay within the top 200 on the iTunes charts and it just helps people be able to find the show more easily. If you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. As a reminder, you can head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. Or if you're interested in being part of Smart People Society, head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com slash society. All right, that's it for us this week. You know the drill. We've got great episodes coming up, so make sure you stay tuned, and we will see you all next episode. In today's age, it can be hard to sit down and learn more. You may think you don't have time to read a book. Well, think again. Blinkist is the only app that condenses thousands of nonfiction books into the best key takeaways. So you can read or listen to them in just 15 minutes. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com smart to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash smart to start your free seven-day trial. Again, Blinkist.com slash smart.